call your attention to this afternoon to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. I'm going to read verses 6 and 7. I've been referring to some other verses in this chapter as we continue giving you a backtrack and give you a little history of Israel. You probably already know but it's a part of this message this afternoon. 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 6 and 7. Speaking this afternoon on this topic, dividing the kingdom. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build in the high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. I need to read another verse. And likewise did he for all the strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed to their gods. Father in heaven, we thank you for the invitation to be here today and the opportunity to preach your word. We pray your Holy Spirit might lead, God, and direct. We pray for everyone here and their families. We do not know what problems they have, what challenges they face, who's sick and who's not sick. But I know that it, probably in every home there's some kind of a challenge, some kind of an issue. So I pray, Lord, for everyone here today. You'll undertake for every one of us to meet our needs, answer our prayers, heal our sick, save our unsaved loved ones, straighten out our wayfaring young ones, Lord, and help us to stay, oh God, in the center of your will. So bless this message today to your honor and your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. To give you a little background of what's happening here, you know that Israel had 12 tribes, naturally. I always thought Saul was the first king of Israel. I learned later there was one minor king that was king before him, but Saul gets recognition theologically and historically as the first real king of Israel. Then came David, then came Solomon. We read about right here. Solomon had a son named Rehoboam, who was, and who did inherit the throne. But after Solomon died, Rehoboam called the old men together and asked them for counsel. And they gave him wise counsel to reduce the burden and serve the people, and they'll serve you all your life. He got some politicians who do that today. Then they asked, he asked counsel of some of his friends, some of the young men. They said, do twice as much to him as your dad did. That's what it amounts to. That's not the way he said it, but that's what it amounts to. Make the burdens heavier, charge more, do more, and if they, you have to punish him, punish him even worse than your father punished him. He followed the advice of the young men. And God raised up another man named Jeroboam, who was a mighty man in Israel. And he sent a prophet and Solomon told him what he was going to do. And in fact, he said, I'm going to divide the kingdom. And that's what happened. Israel was divided into two kingdoms. In Bible college, you learned that there was a northern kingdom with ten tribes, a southern kingdom with two. Jeroboam was, cap was a king over here with Samaria's capital, ten tribes. And uh, Rehoboam was king over here with two tribes, capital in Jerusalem. Well, Jeroboam began to think, well, we go down to Jerusalem to the temple to worship. All these people are going to go back and follow after the tribe of Judah and after Rehoboam. So he began a new religion. He put a gold calf in each place, Dan and Beersheba, north and south, and invited them and told them to come and worship there. From that point on in the Bible, Jeroboam's history was repeated by the prophets time and time again. Every time he's mentioned, it's Jeroboam who caused Israel to sin. That was his epitaph. Jeroboam who caused Israel to sin. And uh, so the kingdom was divided like that. It's a sad, sad thing. But really what happened here is not so much that Rehoboam did what he did. It's because Solomon did what Solomon did. It was because of what Solomon did that God divided the kingdom, not because of what Rehoboam did. You get that? It's because Solomon evil in the sight of the Lord, and that's where it counts, that God divided the kingdom. And we, we don't want our kingdoms divided here. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Now look at Rehoboam. Never was a young man born to more advantage than Rehoboam. 
His father Solomon was known as the wisest man in the world. Bathsheba, the queen of Sheba, came from afar to see the wisdom of Solomon. He went back and said, the half has not been told. And Solomon gathered all this wealth, built that temple overlaid with gold, and all the most of the implements were of gold that he used in the worship. It's beautiful. I, I can't imagine a more beautiful edifice ever erected in the history of humanity than a gold-plated temple. Listening in the Palestinian sun. But there it was. He had done that. But in his old age, he got into woman trouble. And you got to be aware of this, of that problem so common in our country today. And I want to tell you up front, anybody is liable to follow that if you're not careful. So uh, Rehoboam then, after having inherited all of this from Solomon, fouled up because Solomon had married all these wives. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and all of them had false gods, and he began to follow after those other gods. And because of that, in this chapter, 1 Kings 12, 11 and 12, they're pivotal in the history of Israel, and it ended up being pivotal in the history of the world, the dividing of the kingdom, first of all, as the cause of disobedience. Uh, Verse 9 says, The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which, he appeared, uh, which appeared to him twice. And they commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servants. So again, Disobedience, following after all these gods, the gods, the false gods of all of his wives and his concubines, he disobeyed God, and God made this decision. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. That was Rehoboam. I want to tell you that the king disobeyed, and because he disobeyed, God made a decision. And I'm going to take the kingdom out of your hand. In the sad words about Solomon, the last verse of this chapter, verse 43, And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. At this time, those, that scenario I described about Rehoboam getting the advice from two groups and following the wrong group materialized. And we come to uh, chapter 12, verses 19 and 20. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation, and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. Then they got the tribe of Benjamin to follow along later. So the kingdom was divided. And it was divided because of sin, because of rebellion against <clears throat> God. I want to jump a few centuries up to today, November the 9th, 2014. Maybe part November 10th, 2014. I ask you a question about our own country. Is our country divided? Right smack down the middle. Conservative versus liberal. You can almost say the godly versus the ungodly. Uh, the progressive liberal versus the staunch conservative. That's the way it is. We're divided today. We're divided in abortion, same-sex marriage, uh, morality. You just name it. We're divided right down the middle, almost. And what's behind it? I can remember being shocked when I read that you can no longer read the Bible or pray in School. You can mark the digression, the moral and spiritual digression of America from the day, the very date, they took those things out of our public school system. Right. We've taken the Ten Commandments off the wall. We put up signs that say no weapons allowed. We've right. gone that far. And now, you, you, teenagers who just wear a t-shirt to school that have a Christian message on it are either sent home or suspended for wearing that t-shirt. They've had to go to court. Every time they go to court, the students have won. 
but the school system don't know this. They keep persecuting Christians. Are you, are you aware that in our country today, Christianity is the only religion being persecuted? A Muslim can pray anywhere he wants to and even get uh, foot baths put in the school system for the students to wash their feet on before they pray, as they pray. They get all kinds of accommodations granted them, but you can't pray. Even in the military, the chaplains have been told not to pray in the name of Jesus. A Muslim can pray like a Muslim prays, a Jew can pray like a Jew prays, or a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever. They can pray like they pray, but the Christian can't because we're told not to pray in Jesus' name. Some of the chaplains ignore that. Go ahead and do it anyway. Our son Jason has spent one year serving our country in the Mideast. He spent nine months in Kuwait and the last three in Afghanistan. He was in a cat's hair getting blown to bits by uh, a mortar that ha happened and answered the prayer to be a dud. It had a, a little explosive it was supposed to go off. Said the big one off. The little one went off. But the big one didn't explode. He was 15 feet from it and didn't get hurt. There was a wall. He was inside of a barracks. There was a wall between. There was another shrapnel hit him. And nobody really got injured bad. But had that big one gone off, he wouldn't be with us today. But he went down to Fort Jackson to basic training. And Kathy and I went down there, some other folks, to see him graduate from basic training. And they got through, and this chaplain was going to close the program. A chaplain was going to close out in prayer. And it just had happened the news, you cannot pray, chaplains, in Jesus' name. And I thought to myself, I said, they're doing the slow burn. He's not going to be able to pray in Jesus' name. The chaplain's a big guy, big, stalwart, strong guy. He got up there and he said a beautiful prayer, just like you've said in any independent Baptist church, and he closed it out, and he said it loud, and he said it clear, in Jesus' name. I tried to get to him, to pat him on the back, and hug him around the neck, and tell him, you're one of my heroes, buddy, because I know what you're risking. I knew what he risked, but he closed that prayer that day. In Jesus' name. But our, our country is divided, and I'm here to tell you it's divided because of S-I-N-C. It's divided because of rebellion against God. Yet I want to look at this division of the kingdom and discern some lessons from it. I hope you're wearing steel-toed shoes this afternoon. If not, you're going to get your toes stepped on right here. Here's one of the lessons that we learned. That God at no time accepts or condones sin and wrongdoing from anybody. Amen. I don't care if you're lost or you're saved, God does not accept or condone sin. Now, He deals with the saved and unsaved differently, but when we sin against God and we turn around and disobey Him, He will deal with us in one way or another. Now, for the lost, you know what their end is. That's how he deals with them. Uh, no heaven, hell forever. But for a child of God, he chastises those whom he loves. And he scourges every son whom he receives. And I think he must love me an awful lot. And you probably feel the same way about it if you've ever rebelled against him any at all. But God will punish us as Christians for his sins. You know, our children disobey us. They're still our children. We might get angry with them, but we still love them. And we discipline them. We chastise them. And then if God chastises a child of God and he doesn't come back in this life, he'll turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And the judgment seat of Christ, we're either going to receive reward or suffer loss. And we can lose there. If we don't serve God right as His child, in this life, we, can, we won't lose our salvation. We can't lose our joy, our fellowship, our happiness, our peace, and any power we have with God. We can lose all of that. 